I'm Richard Culp. I'm Liz Hayes. I'm Charles Woolley. I'm Jeff McMullen. And I'm Ellen Fanning. Those stories tonight on the very first interactive 60 Minutes, here and on the internet. In this new century, Australia will become a land of giant cities dotted along the eastern seaboard, with an endless urban sprawl stretching between. The average home will be worth well over a million dollars and be wired with computer-linked microphones and sensors. And here, in this wide brown land of ours, we'll be crammed into vast suburbs in bigger, grander houses, but the blocks of land will get smaller and smaller. Out there where the dream home shimmer like a desert mirage, it's Peter Hayes of Henley Properties who's building most of them. In 1990, the average home this company built was about 14 and a half, 15 squares. The average home in this display centre is 31 and a half squares. That's the average. Peter Hayes has become Australia's biggest home builder by creating illusions of wide open spaces, but only within the four walls of the house. And it's not really the house we're paying for, is it? It's the land. It's the land that's in short supply. Far from creating a world of isolation, he sees these new developments. People are going to work from home. It doesn't mean you're going to get up at 9 o'clock in the morning and walk into your study and close. I mean that people are going to spend a significant amount of the time working from home and mixing back into their communities. Good morning, Jennifer. Time to wake up. It's 6.30 a.m. Would you like the news headlines, your diary, or perhaps the weather? Oh, read weather. In the house of the future, it's what, rather than who, will rule the roost. It seems the appliances are already battling it out for supremacy. Good morning, Josh. You have more And the latest in-house techno gossip has it that the fridge wants to freeze out the television. Now, I'm working on dinner. What do you feel like? Any pasta? Um, fettuccine? The fridge is always on. It's normally the centre point of the house in the kitchen. It's normally the message centre of the house with post-it notes and photographs. And we thought, well, we'll take that and make it a, a real electronic appliance. You can uh, put photographs on the screen of the fridge and actually email the photos to the fridge. Oh, which is what you do with the fridge anyway. Yeah, that's right. It replaces the fridge so magnet. Says... That's my niece, Amy. Oh, right. yeah. This prototype fridge called Westie does everything. Its computer will turn on the spa. It can control household lighting and air conditioning, as well as security alarms. On top of that, it bosses around the other white goods and tells them when to get cooking. And, of course, it is also a fridge, but a very smart one. So the fridge effectively can tell you what you've got and what you haven't got? Well, it's got a barcode scanner in it, so it'll keep an inventory of what's in the cupboard. And uh, when you want to go shopping, you scan in the empty items and it'll produce your shopping list which, list, which you can actually read off the mobile phone. Yeah, I can remember the first fridge that my mum ever bought, a Kelvinator. No one in Australia knows more about household stuff than Jerry Harvey. He's just back from Japan, where he's been given a preview of what we'll be buying from him next. At the moment, we've just got a bed we sleep on at night. Into the future, uh, we could have a bed that uh, does a lot of things. It could measure our sleep, our good sleep, our, our, our nightmare time, our snoring time, uh, different things that happen in our sleep. And the scientists will work out a way, maybe, that you're going to need only sleep two or three hours a night. Techno houses, gee whiz furniture and smart appliance. Jetsons promised us 30 years ago. Meet George Jetson. And there really is a flying car on the way. By comparison, making these new offerings from Detroit look like Model T's. You can configure the vehicle to your own personal needs. You can pick up your email from your car. You can turn off your sprinkler system from your car. 
there's going to be a lot of things that you can do from your car that will make everybody's lives a little more easy. Never before has materialism offered so much, yet spiritually we enter the 21st century in a state of disbelief. Deepak Chopra, what are the mainstream churches going to do with all that expensive real estate that they own in the main cities of the world if people aren't going? I think they're going to slowly become extinct. You know, they're, they're like dinosaurs right now, and um, if you're not useful anymore, then um, you have the risk of extinction. That's what's going to happen. Deepak Chopra is a medical specialist who blends Eastern spiritualism with Western science and who's become rich writing a series of New Age Bibles. He joins us, as you would expect, from California. In the 21st century, do you think that it will be spiritually okay to be rich? To have money, to be rich, to have wealth, is, there's nothing wrong with it. Nature is lavish in her abundance almost extravagantly wasteful in her wealth. In every seed, there's the promise of thousands of forests. So when we finally understand the mind of God, we'll realize that it is one where there is wealth consciousness. We're talking about things that are happening to one third of the planet. The wealthy people like you and me, two thirds of the world do not have access to that. And I remember when I worked with Fred Hollows being very strongly affected by one thing he said, the presence of a sick or poor person lessens me as a human being. And while we still have poor people on the planet and sick people on the planet, that is an obscenity that we have to eradicate. Sometime in the future, we may have to confront a cosmic reality in which even our most noble human aspirations amount to nothing. From London comes a much bleaker view of our Earth and our future on it. A one kilometre object will kill about a billion people. Um, a 10 kilometer, kilometer object which, which finished off the dinosaurs and, and wiped out about 60% of all life on the planet would wipe us out. There'd be no place to hide. The whole planet would be covered in molten ejecta. There'd be super winds, there'd be acid rain. There would then be a, a, what's called a cosmic winter. There'd be no food, no harvest for maybe several decades. So we would stand no chance as a race. Bill McGuire is a geologist and the author of the best-selling book, Apocalypse, about a future in which any number of inevitable natural disasters will take our minds off the GST forever. Comets, supervolcanoes and cataclysmic earthquakes. They all come round on a regular basis and the bad news is we're overdue on all counts. There is going to be a major earthquake in Tokyo within the next couple of decades, before 2030. That's, that's almost certain. There are so many faults there which are overdue in terms of, uh, of moving again. So that is, that's probably my favourite for the next catastrophe. Do you think in the long term we should actually be thinking about leaving the planet? if we're going to survive? Absolutely. I mean, we've got all our, all our eggs in one basket at the moment, and, and I would see the next century, or this, this century, as the time we start to move out and, and colonise other worlds. It's, it's essential for the survival of, of any species in the long term, I think. I'm optimistic about the future, and I reckon that we humans will spread through the solar system, and ultimately, within a thousand years, through the galaxy. And I reckon that within, say, a thousand years, half the humans alive will be living off the planet, and still be humans.